Okay, shalom everyone, and welcome to Bits of Torah Truths. And uh, this week's Torah portion is Parashat Devarim, and we're in the Simchat Torah series, the Joy of Torah series. And uh, I titled this week's study, Truth and Preception. And so, um, before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we could come together and we can study your word, we can study the Torah, and we, just, we thank you for all the resources that we have and that you have set before us, Lord. It is such a blessing. Lord, I ask that you would touch Sherry, as a, a friend of mine, that you would heal her body, that you would take away this pneumonia that she has. Lord, I ask that you would heal her in Yeshua's name. Lord, I I pray for each person here. I ask that you would fill them with your spirit and bring joy and peace into their lives. And I pray all these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, so uh, this week's Torah study, it's, we're, we're, this is the first portion in Deuteronomy. It's uh, Parashat Devarim. And uh, I titled it Truth and Perception. And this the portion covers uh, Deuteronomy chapter one to chapter three, and what we find here in the beginning beginning of Deuteronomy that Moshe writes the Torah, retelling the story of what happened that led the people to remain in the wilderness for forty years, and the reason Moshe may be retelling the story might be as a follow up to what happened at the end of the book of Numbers. Remember how that the people of Reuben and Gad had requested to remain on the other side of the Jordan River. You know, they, they requested to remain in the wilderness as opposed to entering into the promises of God, entering into the promised land. And so it could be that the uh, book of Deuteronomy was written with that thought in mind. And the Masoretic text states that the name of the last book of the Torah, the five books of Moshe, is Devarim. And this, this word comes from the opening verse in the Torah, on Deuteronomy in the Torah portion, De, in Parashat Devarim. And it, it write, it's written, Eleha Devarim, meaning that these are the words. And English translators, English translations write the word as Deuteronomy. And this is derived from the Greek translation that's in Greek, Deuteronomion. And that means second law. And because the book of Deuteronomy appears to be a reader, reiteration and summary of the Torah, the book of De Deuteronomy, when we look at, it as a, look at it as a whole, a composite whole, that it can be divided into three major sections. One is the retelling of the journey from Egypt to the promised land leading up to this very moment where we're at. Two, the people are reminded of the necessity to obey God in his ways. And three, discussions on the topic of, un, of the unfaithfulness of Israel and the unfaithfulness that causes the people to lose the land and then the blessings and the curses at the end of Deuteronomy. Now, in the narrative we learn that Israel received God's Torah and they are commanded to turn and go to the promised land and the people are leaving their old way of life and setting themselves on the path of righteousness and holiness according to God's word. That's the purpose of observing the Torah. And as we study the Torah we find many parallels that not only correspond to how we should live, should be living our lives, but also provide an illustration of what happens when we place our faith and trust in the Lord and in the one the Lord sends to deliver his people as opposed to what happens when one chooses to not trust or obey the Lord. Now according to Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 19 to 21 the people did not appear to be unfamiliar with war prior to their entering into the promised land and it seems that the Lord was preparing them to take the land of Israel while at the same time showing them how important it is to realize when he is with them they can do anything. However, if they are disobedient and sin 
they should expect to have fewer victories. And the whole idea is whether the people were believing in and following the Lord or having their doubts in their hearts. Reading through Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 22 to 27, it appears as if the people had some doubts. And they wanted to send men into the land to see what it was like. And the Lord, however, had told them that the land was good prior to their going in. And so on page 2 of the study, the, um, the, the scriptures that we're looking at is from Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 19 to 27. And so let's read through that. And that says the following. It says, Then we set out from Horeb and went through all that great and terrible wilderness which you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, just as the Lord our God had commanded us. And we came to Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea, I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is about to give to, to us, or is about to give us. See, the Lord your God has placed the land before you. Go up, take possession, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has spoken to you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Then all of you approached me and said, Let us send men before us, that we may search out the land for us, and bring back to us the word of the way by which we should go up we should go up in the cities which we shall enter. The thing pleased me, and I took twelve of your men, one man from each tribe. They turned and went up into the hill country, and they came to the valley of Eshcol, and spied it out. Then they took some of the fruit of the land in their hands, and brought it down to us, and they brought us back a report, and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God is about to give us. Yet you were not willing to go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you grumbled in your tents, and said, Because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites and to destroy us. Okay, so um, and that was from Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 19-27. And, and it was interesting that right here, you know, you, you see the people are grumbling, saying how the Lord hates us. You know, and I, I thought about that, and we got to wonder when they were in Egypt that the gods, you know, the Egyptian gods, and even in Greek mythology, we know that there, there are times when they're happy, there are times when they're angry, and it was a matter of appeasing the gods, okay? And in the case of the Egyptian gods, my question would be is that were the people taught that if something bad is about to happen, that the the gods hate you, or that God hates you, or He's angry with you, or or something. It, it could be, you know, they could be bringing that mentality from Egypt, the and, and with them, and then applying that to the Lord God in heaven. And um, but I thought that was interesting. I just thought about that when I was reading that through here. But it could be that they're not letting go what they should be letting go, um, you know, and, and leaving back in Egypt when when they left. But um, the Lord, in, in the Torah portion, the Lord God told the people that the land was good and plentiful. To go up and take the land because he's given, giving it to them, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 21. The people appear to be reluctant, however, to enter the land. And so they recommend to Moshe to send 12 men to spy out the land and see how good it really was. Okay? And there does appear to be some lack of faith here on behalf of the people. At least, that's what it seems to me. When Moshe says, go up and take the land that God is giving you, you know, and they say, well, hold on, hold on a second, hold on a second. Let's send people in to look at how good it really is, right? And so, they, it seems like they had a lack of faith in, in the word of the Lord. And when looking at the rabbis on these scriptures, it's interesting that both Rashi and Rambam point out this aspect of the narrative, that the people were doubting the Lord in their commentaries on the Torah. And so on page 3, I quote on uh, from Ra Ra Rambam on the Torah and Rashi on uh, Rambam and Rashi on Bamidbar, actually. And it says the following, Rambam on Bamidbar on Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 22. 
It says, End for you men, according to your own judgment, I do not command you, if you wish, send. Because Israel came up and said, Let us send up men before us, as it is stated. And you approached me, all of you, etc. Moses, however, consulted the Shekinah. He, Hashem, said, I told them the land was good, as it is stated in Exodus 3.17. I shall bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to a good land. Therefore, your life, uh, their, er, by their life, I shall give them room for error with the matter of the spies, in order that they may not inherit it. The words of Rashi from Enagata. And so, um, it looks like Rambam's credit quoting from Rashi, and so we look at Rashi. Rashi says in Sota 34b from the Talmud, For yourself, I am not commanding you, if you want to send spies. Because the Jews came to Moshe and said, Let us send spies before we enter, as quoted in the verse. Moshe took counsel with God. God replied, I already told you that the land is good, in Exodus 3.17. By my life, I give you the option to choose incorrectly by following the spies and not inherit the land. Okay, so what's interesting is that it looks like God, the Lord, is giving Moshe the opportunity to choose to follow what to follow along with the people, you know, and rather than, you know, because Moshe had that option to say that no, we're not sending twelve men in. We're just going to go in and, and do as the Lord commands. Moshe had that option, but he didn't. He went ahead and sent in, sent in the uh, the spies. And so uh, the Lord said, well, you know, the, the Rashi's saying here that I gave you, that the Lord said that I gave you by my life, you know, by the life of God, that I gave you the option to choose incorrectly by following the spies and not inheriting the land. And... According to Rambam, the Lord showed mercy to the people for rejecting the good land and the Lord was, that the Lord was bringing them into, and he caused them to dwell in the wilderness until that generation of people had died for the purpose of their not inheriting the, uh, what God had promised. And note that God showed mercy by causing them to wander for 40 years. And rather than killing them instantly, he showed them mercy, and they wandered for 40 years. That generation died, and a new generation was raised up then to go in and receive what God had promised. Rambam, yeah, and you know, um, Valerie, Valerie says, it sounds like a little rebellion was operating there, yeah. And you know, as we had read almost throughout all of the book of Numbers, you know, Parashat Korach, um, Balak, and um, the subsequent Parsh Parshiot, you know, that um, there was rebellion, you know, Pinchas, there was rebellion after rebellion after rebellion after rebellion. And the people just wouldn't obey. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, in, like in Pinchas, they were all seated at the, um, at the front of the Mishkan and praying. And, you know, that one guy brought this Midianite woman into his tent, right in full view of everyone. Nobody said anything. Nobody did anything. And it says that 24,000 people died of the plague. The sin of Israel was so prevalent that they, the, the people just weren't doing what they should have been doing. You know, and there was a lot of rebellion. And um, we can we can see that even here in this reiteration of the story when they came to the Promised Land and what's going on with regard to the, the spies. Now, Rambam, he, in his commentary, quotes from Rashi, who says that the people come to Moshe about sending spies, and Moshe goes to the Lord to inquire what he should do. And the Lord God replied, I have already told you that the land is good, quoting from Exodus chapter 3, verse 17. And so, the point is that the Lord told them this land was good and they needed to be obedient and just go in and take what was given to them. And according to Rashi, the book of 
Deuteronomy opens with Moshe delivering a veiled rebuke to the Jewish people. And Rashi explains that each word Moshe uses is an allusion to a sin committed by the people in the desert. Moshe addresses the people in this way in order not to humiliate them with his rebuke so that their sen a sense of dignity can be maintained while they are being reminded of their sins. Now according to Parashat Devarim, Moshe delivered a lengthy rebuke and Rashi's explanation of the nature of Moshe's rebuke is troubling since Moshe specifically rebukes to people by reason of the spy's evil report and in Parashat Ekev uh, he rebukes them concerning the golden calf and if Moshe is so concerned with protecting the dignity of the people then why does he rebuke them at length for these two particular sins and the reason may be that Moshe is focusing upon the people's lack of faith in the Lord God Almighty note the golden calf you know this is your God who brought you up in Egypt you know what Aaron said this is ridiculous but um, so it could be that Moshe is trying to focus on the, the people's lack of faith in the Lord God Almighty and the people were struggling with their faith and the narrative of the Torah reveals to us their struggle with a lack of faith in the Lord at least that's that's what it looks like and so based on on these things the question for us today is why do so many people struggle struggle with a lack of faith in the Lord and what do you think? Why do so many people struggle with a lack of faith in the Lord? We can see this even today in this present age. And when the Apostle Paul said to be of good courage, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight, what he is telling us is to be very careful of our perceptions of the truth. Okay, and the children of Israel saw first hand all of the mighty works of the Lord on the Egyptians. And one would think that if you walked by sight, they would have done, if they had walked by sight, they would have done very well seeing the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night. And the difference is, is that what they knew to be true as opposed to what they believed to be true seems to be the major struggle that occurs in the one who lacks the faith in the Lord and Valerie said that I think people struggle because they do not trust that his word is true or that they have been hurt or burnt in the past and blame Hashem for it doubt and belief is a powerful mind control yeah yeah it is and, and I know that our perceptions come from our lives and particularly the lives that we have lived, you know, what has happened to us in the past, that it definitely shapes and molds our perceptions of, of reality. And um, interesting, um, interesting thing on our perception of reality is that TV series called Mind Games. I think it's called Mind Games. Um, you can add it on Netflix if you don't have if you have Netflix. But Mind Games, they talk about how um, how you can perceive something that isn't true and your mind plays tricks on you it's really I, I find that's a really neat show but um, when when we look at this what we perceive okay the difference between what the people of Israel knew to be true as opposed to what they believed the, to be true was the major struggling point that occurs in the one that lacks faith in the Lord. The people perceived the land to be filled with giants and impossible to conquer. The main reason the people struggled with a lack of faith was found within their perception of what is true as opposed to what they knew to be true according to God's word. And because um, God had said already in Exodus 3.17 that I have already told you that the land was good and um, Valerie also said that or if they do not have a good relationship with their own father especially women have a hard time trusting in a man and some men don't want to admit they need anyone to help them yeah yeah and a lot of a lot of uh, hurt in marriages are the result of 
the man and um, not doing what he should be doing or hurting or um, being mean to his wife or you know etc but um, that can that can really mess up perceptions and not only of the wife but also of your children too you know and but uh, you know uh, there's a there's a book I'm reading right now it's called understanding the mind of a woman <laughs> it's a Christian book but it, it's really good it, I think it's really good I, so far I'm on chapter four so I don't know yet I don't have any conclusions but um it's really good um, anyway uh, but what um, you know now the whole idea I, <laughs> I'm hoping that I'm hoping that'll help well, I mean, I don't have a bad marriage or anything right now, and I, it's um, pretty good, right? But um, there, are, there are times when I don't treat Brandy right, you know, and or I mean, it mainly it's a mean thing, and I want to change that. I don't want to be like that, and it's easier said than done, you know. And I, uh, one of my friends at work recommended that book. One of my Christian Christian friends recommended that book, so I'm reading through it, and it is interesting perspective, interesting perspective. And um, anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Um, but I think that relationships are something that take a lot of work, and especially is uh, our relationship with God, you know, and. Um, so when it when it comes to like perceptions, you know, just like I was, um, let me think. What I was, I don't know, I was trying to think of. I'm trying to think of an example in my life that I can share with everyone. That um, you know, when I did the thing, something I got out of this book. I'll tell you, what I've gotten out of this book so far is that um, one thing that that you know how men are achievement oriented and if you know they how they excel at work and they, they get respect and you get respect um, hopefully at home too and um, by having a, a good job in a nice house and providing what more do you want right and I've fallen into that trap I've, I've fallen into that kind of attitude I, I have and um, because as a man that's what that's the way I think, right? But that's not what Brandy wants. She wants a husband who loves her, that she can trust, and that um, she can say anything, and I won't lash back or lash out, or and that I would also respect her and uh, not be mean to her, you know. And um, meanness can also be somewhat perceptive to you know because sometimes my expression could look mean but I'm not even thinking anything mean you know what I mean and I've, that's happened before and I gotta not be you know anyway but um, the point is is that I guess you know, we're, we're talking about the Torah portion here that um, the perception our perception you know I the way I had perceived myself as a man and the, what my wife is expecting and I, I something that is not not well understood, you know, trying to learn what she wants, what she likes, how she wants to be treated, you know, stuff like that. Um, when we look at God's word, the way we perceive Him not only comes from our 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 past, but also um, from uh, reading and obeying. Just like yeah, like what Valerie, what you said, actions speak louder than words. That um, obeying his Torah is our actions that speak louder than words. And um, the people here, they they didn't they didn't uh, they didn't uh, follow through with the command. They didn't obey God's word to go on up and take the land. They said they doubted, and they said, uh, "Let's send in spies. Let's see if the land really is good." You know, and so they. They, what they knew to be true based on God's word was one thing. What they perceived or believed to be true was something else. And that was something they had to learn the hard way. And faith in the Lord God in heaven is not a belief without 
proof. And clearly, the people here of Israel had been given significant and sufficient proof that is evident by their coming out of Egypt, out of slavery, and out of bondage. Faith is not a belief without proof. Faith is a complete trust and confidence in the Lord God in heaven and in his Messiah, his Deliverer. Our faith is built up over time as the one whom we have faith in proves himself faithful over and over again. You know, God proves himself faithful to us. He proves himself faithful to me over and over and over again in my life. And my faith is built up in him as a result of that. And note that this is what the Lord God is doing in our lives each day by um, in working in our lives. Our faith is placed upon the Lord God in heaven and in the one in whom he sent Yeshua the Messiah. The Lord has provided us with his word, the scriptures, as a testimony of his faithfulness to his people all throughout history. And both the rabbinic commentary, the Midrash, and the apostolic writings speak of the Lord bringing his King Messiah to save his people. Yeshua come with the power of God, with his righteousness, with his authority, to redeem, to deliver, and to save his people from this present evil age and from the world to come. You know, we, we, from uh, Judaism's perspective, that the Messiah, the King Messiah, leads and guides the people back to the Lord, to our Father in heaven. And there was that natural conclusion from the apostolic writings that in him we find salvation and in, in for the, the world to come. And um, like what we're talking in, in uh, Psalm 72 and in the Midrash for next week. The scriptures give testimony of this, and the Lord gives us testimony in our lives by the way in which he is working in empowering us to live for him. And despite these things, we still at times struggle with believing the biblical account because it doesn't match up with our perception of reality. And this idea of reality, of the reality of who God is and who his Messiah is, are very important. That one may believe the historical account that Yeshua was a real person, that he died and that he led a perfect life and was raised to life, but how the Lord gives us his righteousness, how he, he applies that to us, is a more difficult to understand. And the significance of realizing that Lord God in heaven has given us his righteousness is very important because this great truth from the scriptures as taught by not only by David, but by the rabbis and also by the apostolic writings, this is part of our struggle of faith that if we do not understand the Lord has made us righteous so that we have now been called to live righteous lives lives for his glory, then our lives will not reflect the fact that we really believe what he claims. And that's why I've, I've been saying for many years that how the Torah and the Messiah are intimately connected, you know, and that we live our lives according to his word, you know, and I believe that's what Yeshua meant, that if my word abides in you, and you abide in me, you know, that um, the Father in him will make their abode in us. And in Midrash Tehillim 72, part 5, that we're going to be looking at next week, and I, I used some some of that here, um, it says in the Debor Hamat heel that he will come down like rain upon the shearing. And the homiletic introduction to the Midrash states, how are we to interpret the phrase upon the shearing? And note how the sun and the moon are mentioned in the Midrash. You have to read the Midrash um, with a reference to the world to come. And um, Olam, the Olam Haba, the world to come. The glory of God, the glory of the dominion of the King Messiah, and the salvation of the people in this present age are all drawn into the context of the world to come, into the, to the context of the Olam Haba in the Midrash. And what we are seeing here in the Midrash is the importance of the Messiah of God who is made king and is given an everlasting dominion. The Messiah is being given a preeminence or a predominant position as the one who has with him the glory of God, his righteousness, 
His truth and judgment. And this is similar to what we read in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5 through 18, that speaks of Yeshua the Messiah. The author of Hebrew con Hebrews contrasts the Messiah with the ministering angels and then proceeds to describe the supremacy of the Son in direct relation to the Messianic administration of the world to come. And is this not the same thing that's being taught according to Midrash Tehillim 72 part 4 and 5? And you'll, you'll see next week what I'm referring to here. But um, And you can find those Midrashim on the website too, individually. But um, the ideal condition of man is to be ruled by the King Messiah, which is explained by reason of the purpose of his rule and reign, to be the one who judges the poor and the people, the one who saves the needy and breaks the hold of the oppressor, who brings with him the righteousness of God to judge both the righteous and the unrighteous, and who also brings with him the wrath of God to those who do not know him. And, and this is the rabbinic description of the Messiah of God. And it appears, according to the Midrash Tehillim, and it appears to also be the kind of description that is taken from the disciples, Paul, and all of the apostolic writings. And these descriptions from the rabbis and the scriptures provide us with this present day hope and, you know, of salvation from our enemies, you know, help, healing, you know, etc. And of a future expectation of the Lord God in heaven and of the Lord working in our lives to save and to deliver us in our time of need, just like David says. And um, this is something the people of Israel didn't get. You know, when we were talking at the beginning in, in Midrash Devar, no, sorry, um, Parashat Devarim, that they said, uh, let's send in some spies and see what the land's really like. Well, they didn't, they didn't realize that the Lord God is with them. They should have realized that in the conquering that they did as they came to this very point. You know, when the Lord is with them, they had no trouble overcoming the Amalekites, or the Amorites. And um, and so um, they what they, they were lacking, what they were not understanding, is that the Lord is with them and working in their lives to save and deliver them in their time of need, especially in this time when he was going to give them the promised land. And these scriptures are, were, are given to us to build our faith by remembering what the Lord has done and what he has promised to do for his people. And we are his people. And there are many reasons for the phenomenon of the lack of faith as it pertains to how we live our lives. The most significant reason is that many do not understand who God is in relation to our lives and the covenant relationship that we have with him in the Messiah Yeshua. And note how what the Lord God instructed the new generation of people before going into the promised land in Parashat Devarim. They're instructed to continually remind themselves for what the Lord has done for them, saying, in Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 through 7, And these words I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them, shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. And so the significance of these words that we are studying, um, that we are to study, and, um, okay, I read that wrong. It has... Um, getting into this too much. <laughs> okay, the significance of these words is that we are to study and mature in our understanding of the covenant upon which Yeshua the Messiah has come and the Lord God in heaven had sent, you know, his Messiah. The Lord knows that the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak and so he commands his people to be in constant remembrance of these things and not simply as a mental exercise but as a means for applying God's truth in walking in his ways on a daily basis. Now this is why believers need to be constantly reminded of what the Messiah has done for us and what the Lord God in heaven expects our response to be. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 10, 17, so then, by faith cometh, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Our faith is built up as we continually study the word of the Lord. 
and our faith needs to be established upon the word of the Lord. And this is what Moshe seems to have been emphasizing in his reiteration of the events that took past took place over the past uh, 40 years. And in the wilderness, we need to continually keep in mind Paul's exhortation to walk by faith rather than sight as we study and learn about the Torah, that we are learning more about our Messiah and about the Lord God our Father in heaven. And the most important aspect of our faith is that believing in the Word of God, we act upon it and we respond in a manner that demonstrates our faith in the Lord and in His Messiah, Yeshua. Our response should not be based purely upon our perceptions, but upon the sure foundation, the truth of God's Word. And so, and um, that concludes the Torah, the Torah study. But I, I feel that that's why we need to try and shape and mold our perceptions through the study of God's Word, you know, and by living out God's Word, because by, by doing these things that um, we are we are in fact shaping and molding. But what's interesting is that throughout those 40 years, an entire 40 years, there was a generation that was shaped and molded, you know, and um, Reuben and Gad said, let us stay over here and um, you guys go on over there. And the people didn't rebel from going into the land, but the very fact that um, Gad and Reuben were asking to remain on the other side made Moshe really wonder, you know. And it's like, had they not learned anything over all these 40 years? And um, hopefully it won't take us 40 years, <laughs> you know, to wise up and be obedient to his word. You know, I'm 42 years old, and I'm thankful I am who I am today, that God has brought me. He has brought me every step of the way, and I am so thankful for that. And um, I wouldn't go back and change anything, you know what I mean? Because if I were to change anything in my past, I think that I would not be the same man that I am today, and I, I wouldn't be um, doing what I'm doing today, which is, which is such a blessing, you know, serving the Lord. And so, um, anyway, um, study God's Word and uh, base your faith on, on the foundation of His truth and, and His Word. And so, that concludes the Torah portions. Anyone have any comments on that? Well, I'll release the mic.